We all long for happiness. It's the thing we most dream for. Hail to the altruistic revolution. Let's go for it. Now the first exercise is just going to get us ready for the big finale. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having us. Um, can you just put your hands straight up if you love what you do, if you love your work, you absolutely love it. Get out. <laughs> See, in all seriousness, this is not the panel for you. We're not that interested in you guys. Can you put your hand up if you don't like what you do or you're a bit iffy about it or it kind of gets you a bit pissed off quite often? Put your hand up. All right, you're fewer in number, but we want you guys to stay and pay attention. The others of you, feel free to leave. What we're going to do today is we're just going to... There's been lots and lots of stuff about uh, happiness and how to be happy and its causes and so forth. For me, it's all been a little bit too ambitious, all setting our sights a little bit too high. I want to bring them right back down and just try to get through one happy day, <laughs> and that is Monday, OK? So what we're going to focus on is, after all of this stuff you've been talking about for two days and you're going into tomorrow as well, what do we do on Monday when you wake up and you don't feel like going to work? And that is the first question for our panel. Well, I can start. So I have a happiness company, so it's extremely ironic when people come in miserable <laughs> to work. Um, we started this giant gratitude wall. It's the world's largest. It was featured in Inc. a couple weeks ago. And what we, it sounds simple, but what we've tried to do is get people on Monday mornings to post on a sticky note with a Sharpie, and it's super simple, about what they're grateful for about being at work that Monday morning. And it's a simple thing, and it primes you to just start thinking about the week in a healthy way. So it's been uh, a growing installation, and when people read it, it makes them happy too. It's a good start to any Monday. Any other suggestions? Uh, apart from public holidays, I would um, actually start thinking about Mondays on Sunday, uh, and there is evidence that other people do that too. Unfortunately, for, uh, some of the research shows that Sundays are often an unhappy day because people are anticipating Monday, mm -hmm. and Fridays are a, a happy day because people are anticipating Saturday. Um, but for me, I'll start it on, on a Sunday, and I'll be, I'll, I'll be getting ready and making sure I don't go out too late on the Sunday night because I'm getting ready, and I'll have everything organised to get the kids out and just get to work on time, but as I was saying to you before, I'm grumpy on, by Monday Arvo, I'm grumpy, so I deliberately... Don't go, don't go out of sync here, it's still on Monday morning. Avoid, uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, uh, Monday morning I, I work through it, I just do what I need to do, because I'm tired. It's an interesting point, I might, because I might, I get insomnia on Sunday nights, um, did it at school, and do it again now, probably had 20 good years in between where I didn't. Um, is that, is that normal, then? For, for, you're saying that's what well, people... Well, I work at, from home, but I think it's still a challenge sort of waking up on Monday morning and knowing it's the beginning of the week and um, it's got a different energy to it than any other day. I think it's reframing. You sort of look at it, uh, as I talked about a little earlier, you sort of try to find the purpose and the meaning of why I'm doing this, mm -hmm. uh, which is all a little bit difficult over coffee first thing on Monday morning. <laughs> but, you know, reframing... And putting things in context, like you said, gratitude can actually be helpful. Yeah, I, I get that. Um, the whole be thankful thing. Um, <laughs> my, You've my, heard of my, it. My sister said to me, you can either, if you're not happy at work, you can either change your job or change your attitude. That's it. Um, discuss. <laughs> Yeah, that's about it. You, yeah. you, you just You're have right. to change. <laughs> She's right. She's right. Check. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, well, that's what um, the statistics I was talking about earlier proved, that if you've got friends that work as well and you, you've got buddies and you have a bit of a laugh and a bit of a play and maybe a bit of porn stashed on your website. No, sorry, I didn't say <laughs> that. I used to be a sex writer, so I know what people really do in the office um, <laughs> and the amount of time they have sexual fantasies. But, um, yeah, so, you know, you just sort of have that playfulness as well rather than, oh, my God, this is just all about work. So if you retain that within yourself and hide it in your computer and have your playmates, it can actually be um, fun. Yeah, great. So, so if, you are, if you do feeling... If you are feeling a bit uh, 
crap or, or not feeling great about Monday morning about at work and some quick ways to change your attitude, either do a grateful, be grateful, do something like that, create some kind of play environment. Any other tips? I think the, the meaning part to it, the why, the why factor. I mean, a lot of people, they don't have the luxury of choosing their job. They, they have to have their job. They need it for financial reasons. Um, but keeping close that reason, why? Why am I, why am I here? What, am I, what does this money go to? Mm. Am I going to pay for my, keep my kids fed, uh, etc.? And actually being, keeping that in mind. Uh, and sometimes it is overseeing how you feel. That it is, it's the meaning bit, it's not how you feel bit. It's why I'm doing this okay. and keeping that very present. And asking people in um, seemingly menial, menial jobs, uh, often that's what they'll say. I, I love that. Uh, that's, that's, that's gave me a little insight as well, because often people talk about this and say, the why is the meaning of your work, and if you're building a widget, you're not just building a widget, you're making a corporation, and there's often not a why in that, is it? Because that why is about somebody else's why. The why might be your family or keeping food on the table or bringing it back to your home, that kind of thing. Focus on that more as to why you're, why you're there. Yep. And I'm, I'm really, that's so impactful and it's a big thing that leaders forget to do and managers forget to do. And uh, there is this one situation, this story about um, a factory that was really dealing with disengaged people and they were feeling like they weren't contributing. And um, so what the, the sort of leader of the plant did was take a video of what the end product looked like. And because they were building wheelchairs, they were able to show even just on the line and they're just punching on, the, you know, it, their, their role on the line seemed like it was insignificant. And then you actually go and see this man who was in an accident and he became quadriplegic and he couldn't work and he had no mobility, and this wheelchair provided him with mobility, and so they were able to share that story back to these folks that are working on the line, and we forget to do that. Yeah, we so that was like a, bit, a greater meaning, a meaning to do with what the yes, company... you're giving yeah. mobility to someone, and we, we don't realize that our roles are so integral to the bigger picture, even if you're punching yeah. you know, papers together, well, that could be a job offer to someone who doesn't mm. have a job. We need to start telling mm. those stories back to the people inside the workplace. Yeah. I, I don't yeah. want to be rude, um, but there aren't that many wheelchair factories. There's a lot more casinos <laughs> and cardboard <laughs> <laughs> shipping container factories than there are. I think there's a story for, for every, in every situation, and I mean that's a yeah that's a you know very happy story. But there's a story for everyone, and but I think that, that's changing because sorry to interrupt. That's changing because that's what I was talking about before. A lot of companies are now trying to be altruistic. Um, I think it's JB Hi-Fi are actually donating a percentage of the money that the people earn to charity, mm -hmm. and certainly at Macquarie Bank. And so basically, altruism is good for the bottom line, but it's also good for the workers because then the workers see, okay, look, I'm just you know, selling this bit of hi-fi or doing this or that, but the money that I'm earning is going to a greater cause. So I think you know, it's very much about the end outcome, whether you are, like you said, you know, punching holes in something, is seeing that, that you're contributing to something greater. Would you agree? Yeah, and I think even for people to feel a purpose and value and meaning in the fact that they're accomplishing something every day. If you look at, you know, Seligman's PERMA, engagement, relationships, which is going into work and having friends, meaning and accomplishment, that piece of your, your um, purpose in life is really attached to your work, whatever that is. Um, if it, if just because I'm a terrible moderator, if anyone's got any better questions... Just tweet them to me, at Adam Ferrier, and I'll ask those <laughs> questions. So, seriously, so if you do want to ask a question to the panel and not waste their time, that'll be great. <laughs> All right, so, so we've, got, we've got over Monday morning. We're now into Monday lunchtime slash afternoon. We're kind of bored, disenfranchised, or just the day is blurring past. Any other advice? Keep a whiskey under your desk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's brilliant. Uh, we, I think, I, and I don't know what it's like around flexibility in Australia and around the world, but I know in Canada there is sort of a drive to work within the hours that you are most productive. And so we've got these sort of inside of our organization, we're seeing this a lot more in startups and other organizations where 
you know, if you're feeling really tired at two, but you have the flexibility to have work-life integration, you can mm -hmm. go home, you can do other things, and then you can work later on the day. That This is a knowledge-based workforce now that we're moving towards, so that makes it more likely. It doesn't necessarily work in manufacturing, but in a knowledge-based economy, we are going to see more of this ability Which to Which is what's going to happen home. more. Robots are actually going to do those right. jobs, and we are going to be doing more. Um, technological yes. based things which can be done anywhere sitting on top of a mountain. Um, yes. I used to work for my laptop in Byron Bay in a rainforest. Mm -hmm. Lindsay, any, any thoughts from you? Move. <laughs> Go for a walk. Yeah. Uh, just move. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. That's That sounds very simple but the, the many man manifestations of that, big impact. Yeah, um, great. Yes, yeah. Yep, cool, good. I think also I just wanted to come back to that hedonistic level, because we were talking before about eudnomia and the happiness that comes from a greater pleasure, all very well and good, but I am actually a hardcore hedonist. So I really think it's great if you are in the office or whatever, you just keep little treats for yourself. You might have a little bit of a chocolate thing there to sort of treat yourself. I sort of treat my inner child. It's like, here you go, you've been good, have that, or, you know, I'm not joking about having a, a nice Chardonnay or something. It's like really making sure that you do have a laugh during the day and you reward yourself. I say watch a YouTube video too sometimes. Yeah. I always say take a break and watch a one minute yeah. or two. Move is important, but if you can get laughter in your day somehow, yeah. and if you have that you know, 20 videos that you go to that always gives you a chuckle and give yourself an, a minute or two minutes of laughing, it really does, and it seems silly, but it really does What Donald make you Trump feel said better. overnight, you know, waking <laughs> yeah. up in the morning and having a look at what Donald did, that's always a great There's, amusement. Yeah, that is entertaining, yes. Apart from, apart from the stream of abuse, there is one good question here from Trisha Carter who said, uh, are there any uh, workplace-wide practices and rituals that have been proven to be successful? Oh, many, yes. Yeah, well, um, many. So um, one of the ones that we work on is uh, vision and goals and setting goals and, uh, you know, f five, we call them five-minute goals and then monthly goals and six-month goals but um, and track to them. But um, also to, so you're, you're looking at what you want to um, increase in your own, you know, five minutes in the day and it could be, I want to be more grateful. Um, one of the things that we suggest too is thanking people. And if you were in the talk earlier, I said to set up a meeting with yourself on Fridays to send a text to someone and say thank you. We even just take a sticky note and say thanks on someone's back of their chair. And that can improve the workplace experience and it increases community and uh, I actually think really healthy. one of the things yeah. that really used to work very well was just the affection we could show each other and hug and just be, when I did used to work in an office, they've gotten rid of that now. It's sort of sexual harassment. You can't <laughs> hug anybody or yeah. laugh too much or look at them. There's all sorts of laws now about bullying. If you give someone a haughty look, that's now bullying. So, you know, you've got to be really careful how you look, how you smile. So it's a funny thing because we've gone so forward, but we've also gone so far backwards in terms yeah. of the over-politicising of the workspace into politically correct... Um, um, Lindsay, Nikki Gee has asked um, if you feel... If, sorry, actually, maybe I shouldn't have said... Do you mind if I read out the question? Uh, I better not actually now. Hi, Nikki. Yeah, no, no, it's not be all of you to decide whether I can or not. Um, <laughs> any tips on? Um, sorry, uh, how have the panel managed a significant setback in your particular career? Ooh, well, I got really bad depression. Um, I got brought back from Byron to do a major job, and after six months, I had a severe depression and couldn't actually even go into the office. I sort of spent time staring at a brick wall. So, you know, it was failure. It was failure. And how I dealt with that was I saw how actually it made me a better journalist because I became so much more empathic towards other people. So I recovered from that setback by looking at what it had given me. And that wasn't just positive psychology. It really did help me to interview people and look at people and understand people so much better. So, um, it, you know, I just got, it's not about me, it's not about my sadness or how I look, it's about what I'm doing and what I can give back. And so the setback helped me to get over my ego and the shame and humiliation of it. Cool. 
Lindsay, I, 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 um, I once went to see a psychologist who was going to be an org, org psych, yep. and they said they started saying how it's not necessarily in the best interest of a person because you have to drive them towards profitability for the business. This is a question from, some, uh, from Daniel Murray. How do you balance the ruthless drive for profit with mental health? Well, if, if you go right back to where the old happiness worker hypothesis was, you know, happy worker, more productive worker, and that's quoted a lot, and it's, there's some evidence for it and there's some evidence not, not for it. But I, I think it, one of the things is thinking on multiple levels. There's an individual level, there's a team level, there's an organisational level, uh, and it, it is a balance. There are some things that the individual's got to do, uh, and then the, which they own, and there's some things the organisation and teams have to do. But part of it is, uh, like autonomy support, um, Richie Ryan's here, self-determination theory, part of it is the sense of ownership over the goals. It's not, you, they have to all be your goals, but you feel like they're yours. And I think that distinction, that felt sense of ownership over goals and tasks, and if that's aligned with organisational outcomes, fabulous. Some managers are good at instilling that, some, some less so. So I think that subjective ownership part, not it's me and yours, it's I feel like part of me is aligned with this organisation. The profit, productivity, profit relationship, you know, people say happy worker, we're more productive, we make more profit. There are so many other things that can determine an organisation's profit than the individual happiness. It contributes, but there are many, so I think it's more, let's be clear about what we're, what we're, what we're talking about. Um, okay. I don't, okay. Um, so everyone, I think everyone's going to be happy on Monday now. Just yeah. one more uh, question. <laughs> Worst bit of advice you've ever had or could give um, or received about making being happy in the workplace? Going into work. <laughs> <laughs> Don't work at all. Yeah. Don't go into the office. Um, no, that's actually the best bit of advice. Worst bit of advice? I don't know. You said the worst? Do you want to know the worst bit the of worst? advice? That's I, a tough question, I, I guess. So. Just take care of yourself. That's what I've been told. Just take care of yourself. Don't worry about them. Just take care of yourself. That's bad advice? Yeah. Uh, kills trust. Um, people find out. People can sense it straight away uh, rather than... You know, one of the reasons we go to work, one of the many, is for our colleagues and our peers. The actual social part of, of work is really important and there's mental health literature will show that. You know, why do we want people to be in employment apart from income? It's the social network. Um, so if you isolate, then you're, you're losing half of the benefits from work. I would say to you, just measure engagement. That would be the worst advice. And people think that you measure engagement and you're actually way downstream. You're pulling people out of the river that are drowning instead of actually figuring out why they're falling in. And that's, a, that's an important distinction around cultures that are actually healthy is when you look at trying to build things like hope and inspiration and trust and reduce depletion and increase empathy. Those are the things that you should be working on because then engagement, profitability, all those things, yeah. even happiness is downstream. And so many people focus on, let's just measure engagement and then we'll figure out how to engage people and they've got it all wrong. Well, on, on that note, in my last agency, despite what everybody told me, I instigated this thing where you'd have a yellow button to press at the end of the day if you're happy and a black button to press at the end of the day if you're sad. And everyone said it was a shit idea, and we did it, <laughs> and it was, it was terrible. Um, it just, yeah. just, yeah. That's all we were doing was measuring engagement. So that yeah. proves I was completely unqualified to host this panel, but thank you very much for the insights. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.